Hey there, everybody. Grant Diggles with Health Professionals Alliance, and I am your host of The Real Docs Show, where we talk with real doctors, we talk about real topics, and we spotlight real solutions. If you're an independent practice in medical or dental, and you want to protect your independence, HPA has a message for you. Don't get consolidated. Instead, join the HPA family with other independent practices and groups across the country in both medical and dental. Protect your independence, control your patient care, thrive in the market, and build your wealth. If you want to be a part of this exciting model that's sweeping across the nation, you can visit www.hpamembers.com. If you're interested in reaching out to us, we make this easy. Below each of our episodes on YouTube, in the description box, there is a link that will take you to an indication of interest form to set up a 30-minute meeting with us so we can talk about those value propositions with you and find out if HPA is a great fit. Today, we are speaking with a dentist that has been in a DSO, started her career in a DSO, found that it wasn't the right fit for her and decided to transition into independent practice. So we're gonna learn about her experience in the DSO and listen to the reasons why she made the decision to transition into into independent practice. So let's get started. So my guest today is Dr. Taeyung Kim of Tualatin Dental Care. Dr. Kim, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for joining with me today. How are you doing this morning? Good, good. How are you, Grant? (laughs) I feel very very energetic and very excited to uh, have this conversation with you. So uh, Dr. Kim... You have a very unique experience that I think will bring a lot of value to dentists out there. You know, there's a lot of DSO action happening across the country. And, uh, you know, typically what we're seeing is we're seeing dentists who are considering DSOs and they have already been in independent practice, but you did it a little bit differently. So you started in a DSO and spent some time there, had your experience and then decided to transition out. So before we talk about that experience, uh, why don't you share just a little bit about yourself and then we'll jump into the content. Hello everyone, I'm Taeyang. Um, I am a GP, I graduated from NYU, been practicing for about 10 years. I've been to three different DSOs and then one private practice before I bought my practice. So I've been working for about 10 years but as a private practitioner, or I own the business for about five years now. Um, currently, I own a practice that has multi doctors in in Tualatin, Oregon, and it's been great. I was really happy to have you on the show, and and when we decided to start Real Doc Show, your your name was one of the first that came up from everybody here, and it's like, oh, you got to talk with Dr. Kim about her experience, and it truly is a unique one. Now, just for clarification reasons, you did, you got out of school and you went directly into a DSO. Is that right? I graduated from New York and then my family decided to move to California and California was really saturated city. So for as a new grad, there was no other choice but to go for um, DSO because there's no other jobs available. So Mm. even for DSO, it was really hard to get in but I had a good chance to get in to one of the DSO. And then, yeah, that's how I started. Was it partly because that's what was available or was there also like, hey, I don't know enough about business yet to like go out and like start my own thing, get Mm -hmm. the overhead that I'm going to be taking on and all of this infrastructure. So was part of the reason to, to come into a DSO early just because they had infrastructure for you and they provide you the management it was a good place to cut your teeth was that one of the elements that impacted your decision there i think almost every dentist understands you know in dental school there's nothing about business so people don't teach you know how the business goes 
And then once you're in the real business world, I'm like, oh my gosh, the, what is this? You know, this is a whole new world. Mm-hmm. So when you're when we're in dental school, usually DSO comes by and they present themselves, you know, as the best place to work. Of course, you know, we don't have any idea. So that's the only thing we know. Of course, we hear about the private practices, but it doesn't really, um, there's no opportunity out there. Okay. So, and everyone says, you know, you start with the DSO. That's how I just, just jumped into DSO. And I was glad that I, I got an interview um, <laughs> and got a job. So even in California, I just, it, it was just almost no opportunity, but just to go into DSO. I did approach to private practices before. Okay. But no, there was just no opportunity there. So it really just kind of organically happened. The opportunity was just what the opportunity was. And so you, here you are. I didn't know you were in three different DSOs and uh, specifically who they are doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, let's talk about early on in your career with the DSO. Let's talk about the good stuff first. So what were what were some of the things about the DSO that you did like that? Did you feel like they kind of gave you a leg up in your career to kind of get moving and learn or? I guess doesn't matter if you're in dentistry or any other job um in the real life the stuff that you learn from school is not everything that could be possibly like five percent of what you will be doing so Mm -hmm. it was a really good experience for me to just start learning about how to treat patients how to deal with the patients and also even for like experiencing more opportunities i mean more experience with more cases. So Mm. that was a good start. And also it was a good experience for me to learn about the business side of it as well. Sometimes a DSO or an MSO is a good fit for a a doctor, right? Um, For you, obviously it gave you a leg up. You got to learn um, in an environment where uh, you didn't, it was all kind of set up for you. So you didn't have to like recreate the wheel and start those things on your own. So that's, that's, that is really good to hear that you were able to utilize that as a solution to kind of bring your career into reality. Mm-hmm. So aside from like the the infrastructure of the DSO model and some of the things that you liked about it, I mean, ultimately you made the tough decision to kind of uh, go out and be independent. That's a big transition, a big decision. So let's talk a little bit about your experience in the DSO and the things that you mm-hmm. you didn't like. Like, what were some of the things that kind of pushed you to the point where you're like, you know, uh, this isn't for me? So when I got the first job, um, it was a whole new experience as a, as a new grad. Um, so in the DSO, you do have, they do have multiple levels of management. So the interview process is multiple interviews. And even after you get a job, there's more involved with the business side of it. So they watch you, they control you, what to say and how to act in front of the patient and what to do. It's not about, there's no autonomy of the dentistry. So as a dentist, so they set up as steps by, I mean, step by step so that, you know, they can follow whatever the steps that they already set up for you. And there are multiple meetings that you have to go to as a staff member and, you know, doctor's meeting. And also just almost every other week, you have to go for these mandatory meetings. And so in California, I did stay with this uh, DSO. I I would call it as DSO A. And um, there was one owner doctor there who you would think, you know, it will be a lot of uh, learning experience from the owner doctor, but it wasn't really good. I guess I learned how to, um, how to be a real dentist, how to be a real practitioner, like for patients, not for money. So since there is multiple management uh, levels, they usually go for dollar sign, not for the patient care. And also there are specialties that, you know, they set up for the days that they can come by, which is once a month. So there are a lot of specialty procedures that we're not supposed to do. 
So especially root canals and extractions, even if it is simple extractions or root canals, still we cannot really do it. Implants, of course, you cannot do it either. So there's no um, extension of your skills. Pretty much mm-hmm. you just do restorations only every day. And also they push a lot of Sarah crowns. So even if, you know, it is just um, simple fillings that, you know, you can do, they push for the inlays and onlays. So, and they do have a system that, you know, there's a ranking system. It shows you like which dentist did the most and which dentist is not really following. Really? Yes. Wow. And also- Like a production ranking system? Yes, yes. There okay. are a ranking system for um, office and also regional and also national. So usually, you know, you can see who's who's winning or who is in that. And okay. you get the awards and- I've gotten some awards, but it's just, <laughs> yes. So pretty much, you know, you can't really do much. So um, also, you know, there are supplies that you can only use because they are in tight budget. So you cannot order certain things. So even though the composite is like not looking good and it's really set already, you cannot even put it into the prep itself still, you know, you cannot really change them. So there's a lot of limitation. So after the first experience, and I did go to, I did move to Oregon and I went to DSOB because DSOB. DSOB. (laughs) So (laughs) DSOB uh, hired me because uh, I got referred by DSOA's specialist. And then I got, again, it was the same thing. There was a multiple levels of it management. And Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, it's the same thing. Lots of limitations, specialty procedures you cannot do. And also DSOB does not have opportunity to own the part of the office. Okay. And and so DSOA in Oregon approached me back and then they were offering me to be an owner doctor. So I moved back to DSOA in Oregon. All these limitations was giving me uh, the thoughts that, you know, I cannot really grow. So, and also I have to attend all these meetings. There was lots of time, that personal time that I had to put out to. So, and then I was getting more regret because all these multiple levels of management, they were coming from non-dental background. So it was really hard to communicate with them. So they just look at us as a dollar making worker, not yep. dentist. Finally, I was about to sign for uh, ownership, which is the 49% of the whole ownership, but yep. pretty much, you know, the majority owner is the corporate, not the, the doctor. So we cannot really say much. And also the production percentage was not really different from as a associate doctor either. So there was not a huge benefit. Yes, you okay. will have more to say, but not a lot of difference. And at that time, another owner doctor from a private practice approached me for with the partnership opportunity. So I just got okay. from the DSO. It sounds like the biggest difference for you in making this transition was the fact that the DSO was really more focused on production it was more focused on the bottom line they probably gave you um you know basically um a list of <clears throat> things from instruments and other things that you can use because they have contracts for the best price for those things so it's like well if i want this type of pick or whatever it is that you want they're like well that's not what we do so you're using this brand and everything was really about just the bottom line so it was kind of a, a money driven uh corporation, right? Which, you know, that's, that's what corporations do. But it sounds like the biggest contrast is that if we could really simplify it, it was like, okay, DSOs were about the money. And, you know, based on what I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, it wasn't really necessarily about the patient care. It wasn't about the opportunity to connect with the patient on a, on a personal, um, in a personal way. And then of course, it's kind of sound like even the way they were wanting you to relate to the patients was kind of scripted or canned in such a way. It's like, Hey, this is our brand. This is our image. This is what we do. 
There's no self-expression. Here's your script. This is how you treat patients. And we're on a tight budget because we're, we're really driving the bottom line here. So <clears throat> it even sounds like even if uh, the, the outcome for a patient wasn't something you were very happy about, they're like, don't fix it because that's just more money out of our pocket to, to, to fix that. And it's, it's good enough. Right. I'm, and I'm, I'm kind of filling your mouth with words here a little bit. So, you know, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but that's kind of what I feel was happening. And that led to just a lot of dissatisfaction for you. Is that yeah. you're like, OK, this is. No, I, I would say I, I would say it's not about like mm, I would say it's more of the over treatment. So mm. it's not like um, not treating the patients right. I guess it is not treating the patients, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it is a little bit more of the over-treatments. When the feelings could be enough, adequate enough, you are forced to do more treatments that cost more than twice or three times of the filling cost. So, Which, which would ultimately end up going to the patient, right? That cost. Yes. yes. Okay, so now there's... You know, kind of going back to the money thing, now the costs are kind of going up for the patients too, right? So um, so you segued us into the next question. So you kind of went through this season MSOA or sorry, DSOA, DSOB, then back to DSOA, mm -hmm. where they offered you 49% ownership in whatever. Like we don't need yeah. to get into those details. That's not controlling share. So it's kind of like, oh yeah, 49%, but we still make all the decisions, right? Because we're yes. 51. Mm -hmm. So uh, simple enough. So you are unhappy with the situation and you're like, okay, there's some things about me that I want to express to my patients. I want this independence. I want to call the shots. And so tell us about this transition. So you mentioned that an independent doctor reached out to you here in Oregon Mm -hmm. and invited you into the possibility of joining forces with them. So can you tell me a little bit about that story and how that went for you? So I was getting regrets after being with the DSO for about three, a little over three years, about four years or so. Um, I couldn't really talk to the management, even though there is autonomy, a little bit of autonomy, but because of the limitation of the supplies and also sources, pretty much, you know, you just stuck with, you know, doing whatever the, the management was doing. And, and then this uh, private owner, private practitioner, um, he approached to me and then said, okay, why don't you just come over and then we'll talk about 50% ownership, which is partnership. Um, okay. So yes, and so of course, you know, there's more opportunity. I can do all other uh, procedures that I never done, which is implants and more, more root canals and crowns. I mean, crowns, yes, but root canals and extractions. So it was just no brainer. I just had to go for it. And you know, so you, you just listed off a, a, a round of different procedure types. So you not only got into something where you had a true partnership, where you could call the shots um, with with your true partner. Um, but the other thing, it sounds like by getting out of the DSO, it allowed you the autonomy and the freedom to start expanding your craft. Right. So you weren't just pigeonholed into like, OK, Dr. Kim. You're in the DSO. This is what we need you to do. And that's it. And now being an ind independent practice, you are like able to do other procedures, things that really represent the full scope of your practice. Right. So now did you find that um, one of the questions I really want to know is like on a scale of one to ten, if I can say it this way, what was your happiness in the DSO on a scale of one to 10 versus getting into private practice. And what was your happiness on a scale of one to 10 in private practice? I would say right away it was seven, but it was totally different setting. So mm -hmm. I still had to learn about how the private, private practice runs. So mm -hmm. it was more of my work as well. And also I had to learn a lot of other procedures that I haven't been doing. So it was a stress, but it was a happy stress. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that um, was in, and on the private side? Yes. Okay. 
in contrast from the DSO to private practice now, um, how do you feel that you've changed in how you relate to the patients in private practice? So what were the things, obviously it was scripted on the DSO side, but how do you work with your patients now? Like where are, how are you creating that culture and the value in connecting with your patients each day? The reason that I moved to private practice, of course, you know, there were more autonomy in there. And also I can do whatever I like to do. In dentistry, there's a lot of different fields that I never noticed in dental school. Okay. So you can do a lot of stuff in dental, I mean, in the private practice. And you can, of course, you got to be responsible for it. But at least you can help the patients a little bit better, not like limiting to crown inlay onlys. Um, you can do, you know, if the patient comes in with the infection, you know, you start the root canal or extraction, whatever that's need, that needs to be done, instead of waiting for that specialist to come in, which is a month away from that day. Of course, the patient's not going to be happy because they're swollen this way, but they still have to wait for the specialist to come in. Yep. Yep. You have right away, you can fix the problem for the patient. And there is a the connection with the patients. You you do have a long term relationship with the patients. In DSO, the long term relationship isn't. It's really hard to achieve. It's just really okay. rare. Um. So yeah, that that's a huge difference right there. So as a new grad, of course, you know, only the DSO is the option out there. It's really good opportunity to learn what not to do. And also mm -hmm. that settled in myself that, you know, how to do business side of dentistry as well. Yep. I didn't know, I didn't learn anything about insurance or the actual business, actual money part of it, but I've learned how to talk to patients so that the patient can understand because these all these DSOs they studied about it so for a long time. What makes sense for the patients that that was already set up. So I've learned a lot about those. I've used that even after the I got out of the DSO for a while, but now it's more mingled into the DSO way and also you know my own what a uh, own experience altogether. So there's not much of trouble talking to patients. The way that you're framing this scenario in your life seems like, number one, it made a lot of sense for you, right? Just logical sense. You got an opportunity to cut your teeth in a lot of different ways. So let's let's flip that around. I'm just going to ask you a question on this and get your opinion. So let's take a different scenario here. And we have a doctor, a dentist that's been in independent practice for years, right? Now, you've kind of described ESOs pretty well. So an independent dentist making a decision to be independent and then go into a DSO, um, you know, maybe they don't know because they haven't been there before like you have, right? But what, in your opinion, would motivate an independent dentist to entertain the idea of going into a DSO? After practicing for an owner doctor for about five years, I've had lots of stress. <laughs> it is... <laughs> It is just unavoidable, <laughs> but yeah. as let's say I'm a little older and if I'm thinking about maybe going back to DSO, the good opportunity would be, again, you know, the staff, they're given to you. So you don't have to look for the staff. And also there's marketing out there that they do, which is not really geared towards your own practice. So it's usually whole region or whole national Mm -hmm. um, marketing, which is not really specific to your office, but still there, the marketing's there. So you can yep. still get patients out there. And, and also, I guess you can hang out with other doctors, which, you know, has meetings that you have to go to. So <laughs> if you like those, yes, yes, that is a good part of it. <laughs> For dentists, that value relationship is a big one, right? So for you, I would imagine in the DSO world, um, you probably saw some reoccurring patients come in that you treated, but did you find that most of it was like new faces most of the time? 
And uh, so it was difficult to build those relationships because I would imagine with your independent practice, you're probably seeing people on the regular, right? Families, uh, their kids, you know, you have an opportunity to build a relationship. And did you see that contrast happen with DSOs where it was just like, okay, here's your next patient. And you're like, hi, I don't know you. And I'm going to be in your mouth now for an hour uh, versus independent practice where you have a chance to build relationships with your, with your patients. Am, am I getting that right? Or is there, yes. am I missing that? So the DSO offices, they usually advertise for um, certain dollars, cleaning, exam, x-rays. So the patient comes in, usually they look at you like, okay, I'm getting these with this much dollars. That's what mm -hmm. usually you get. So the relationship from the get-go is not really there. You know, they are not here to see me. They're not, they're here to see those covered, you know, with the certain dollars. But with the private practice, you know, with the patients, of course, you know, you are there for a long time and you get the long-term relationship. But since they are coming in to see you, it's, yes, you know, it's starting point is completely different. They do look at you differently. They don't look at you as how many dollars. They look at you like a doctor. I've been seeing a lot of patients for a long time and some kids just grow up. They They've been like so small. They were really <laughs> small. And then now they're taller than me. They're off to college. And it's really sad at the same time. But it is, yep. you know, I know whole family. Those are not really happening in DSO that much. Yes, you it, it is possible if you are there for a long time. But the amount difference is, the number is huge difference. I love that you're on the show because you're bringing like all this honest content. And I think a lot of dentists are going to relate to what you have to say, especially if they're in consideration of transitioning one way or the other, right? So one of the things I want to finish with here is you started with a DSO, you went into private practice, um, and now, you know, full disclosure here is uh, you're actually one of the founding members of Health Professionals Alliance. So you're actually part of the HPA family with other dentists and physicians across the country, and yet you're still independent. So my question is, is um, why did you join HPA? You're already independent. You're already running a successful practice. And yet you still decided with that in consideration to jump in and become part of the HPA family. So would you uh, share with the audience a little bit why, um, with all of that considered, why did you join HPA? What, was, uh, what, is, what is it about the model that drew you in to be a part of this family? HPA is pretty much you're still your owner and you can do mm -hmm. whatever you like. You, you can keep doing whatever you want to do. Um, and also you still get lots of discounts on, you know, as if, you know, you're in DSO, you are getting great benefits mm -hmm. from multiple different services. And also without even knowing I got discounts from certain things and I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> it was a nice surprise. And um, also, you can still talk to other doctors as if you're in DSO. You, I've got great, uh, no, great uh, referral to one of those course, and it was a great course. And one of the founder members told me to mm -hmm. go to that one. It was just eye-opening for me. It was just a complete different view of the dentistry. And also lots of uh, services like, you know, um, accounting, HR, and also um, uh, the legal, legal services and, mm -hmm. and also the retirement plans, which I'm going to probably sign up this weekend. Um, so <laughs> you get extra discounts as if you're in D DSO. So you don't have to be limited by someone else, but at the same time, you can still get all these benefits. I appreciate that. And that really is the heart of HPA is to, you know, protect independence. You know, we want to see, we want to see physicians and dentists across the country controlling their patient care, controlling their practices, you know, owning their practices themselves. We want to see 
independent practice perpetuated into the future. And there are, yeah, there are a lot of services. I like that you said, it's like, oh, I didn't even know that HPA could offer this to me. And that was a nice surprise. And uh, um, so I really appreciate uh, you sharing that part about uh, why you're part of the HPA family. You have pearls of wisdom and I'm trying to get them all out. So do you have any recommendations to the audience on um, what to look for on the DSO side? And if you might recommend uh, HPA or not in whatever situation they might be. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about DSO, I want you to think about it again, what you do, what you like to do, and that can be limited. Um, if I understand, you know, everyone's having lots of stress, you know, just being an owner doctor <laughs> is not really easy. It's, it's, it's a lot of different stress that you know comes to you. Everything is on your shoulder, but you have to think about which one's better. You know, do you want to be a little bit of stress, but you know, limiting yourself for everything, or you still have um, autonomy, and also at the same time, if you want to sell it. You know, you can sell it anytime, you know, it's if mm -hmm. you sell it to DSO, then you can't really go back. Usually they do have a limitation of being in there for at least two to three years. That's what I heard before. So okay. two to three years. I don't know if you want to do that. So with the HPA, there is a opportunity to invest as well. So you can think of it as a retirement plan as well. And um you can still get the benefits of all the things that you can get from DSO as well. So just think about it one more time. <laughs> well, I appreciate it very much, Dr. Kim. And I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on The Real Doc Show with us. Um, if you are interested in learning more about HPA, uh, we want to invite you to go to hpamembers.com to check us out on the website. Um, we want to continue to grow this family. We want to continue to help independent practices thrive in the market, build their wealth, uh, have the services and resources they need at discounted prices to continue to expand their bottom lines. Um, but the biggest thing is uh, we think patient care is best in the hands of independent practices where they still can make a dollar. But at the same time, um, they can connect with patients, they can have a relationship and they can have a uh, fulfilling experience. So, uh, Dr. Kim, thank you for being on The Real Doc Show today. I really appreciate your time. You were wonderful. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that concludes our Real Doc Show for today, where we talk with real doctors, we talk about real topics, and we spotlight real solutions. Thanks a lot, Dr. Kim. Thank you.